Convene sub three and begin part B of our agenda. Good afternoon. We're beginning part B of today's agenda with the uh, Department of Health Care Services. Under this first section, we'll be uh, reviewing items 4260, the department, item 5180, Department of Social Services. We're going to continue with our conversation in the context of the continuum of care reform. Um, first issue being the short-term residential treatment center licensing, page three of the agenda. Great, so uh, Jennifer Kent with the Department of Healthcare Services and um, obviously we will be um, using uh, various individuals throughout the rest of the budget agenda um, to speak to some of the specifics, but really wanted to both highlight and, um, and agree with all of the comments from the previous um, both panels and discussion on the CCR and the implementation and to say that it is a um, both revolutionary and significant change in how we work within the foster care system. I think that what we've learned from a State Department perspective working closely with social services is that um, it is not easy. Um, it will take a lot of work and it's certainly an evolution um, that we are committed to because we think that it's obviously the right thing to do for this um, very fragile population that requires services not only from social services but also from healthcare services. Um, just to highlight um, some of the work that we have been engaged in with the Department of Social Services and um, some of our own learning experiences that we um, readily acknowledge is that um, our words and our terminology is different. Mm -hmm. So um, certification to us means something very different to social services. Um, there was a couple of lightning aha moments where they said certification and we said, well, um, Medicaid certification and they said, no, our certification. And so that was um, one thing. Um, permanency in the social services world is very different than a permanency in a Medi-Cal context um, mm -hmm. in terms of payments. Mm -hmm. So we're still continuing and I, I use these um, somewhat as a joke but also just to highlight um, we are blending a set of services and a, and a set of facilities and a set of programs that have not been blended before and so sure. we are both um, committed to doing that work thoughtfully and appropriately but we're also mindful of the fact that at the center of this are children that are relying on us as a state to provide for them the services that they they need to be um, both you know healthy adults and productive citizens so with that I will let um, Karen obviously walk through some of the key pieces of both our budget proposal as it pertains to this as well as the work that's underway with the um, counties and the mental health side of the program good afternoon chairwoman and senator Monning Karen Baylor Department of Health Care Services um, we are requesting one permanent position to help with this process and then a phased in approach over the next several years for additional staff. Um, mental health plans are responsible for the provision of or arranging for specialty mental health services. And so we see this as a key component within the CCR. Um, I asked Greg at one point if I could put in a red phone into a budget proposal because we are talking frequently. Mm -hmm. He did offer me an office in his on his floor, so I, I was very appreciative that was of generous. that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but we are meeting on a regular basis and have conversations. I, I do want to talk about the certification piece uh, a little bit. Um, we. We started uh, with the CCR work groups and there wasn't a des uh, designated mental health work group at the very beginning because it was so interwoven into all the other topics, but soon discovered uh, in conversations that I had with Sarah Rogers that we needed to break it out and to have a separate mental health work group because the issues were popping up all over and there wasn't a central focus of where we could deal with that. We had a couple of meetings just with the state and county 
County uh, family in order to talk about the certification, and that's where, as Director Kent talked about, there really became some eye-opening experiences with how you define licensing versus certification, and then to complicate things, we had certification and we were using it twice for two different processes and so um, it became very eye-opening to us uh, as to why there was so much confusion around certification and so we're proposing some different language but we have dealt with the uh, STRTP certification piece as far as uh, having DHCS do that work or have it delegated to the counties. We are supposed to deal with the certification of the FFAs uh, this afternoon at the state and county implementation team. So just we're mindful of time. <laughs> so yes, just quickly on, on the semantics issue, which mm -hmm. is very real, is that going to require any kind of legislative cleanup, you think, we fundamentally? We are going to clarify some language, and we, we have submitted some additional language into 1997. Yeah, so that it is clear that there is a Medi-Cal certification, but then there is a program and they used to call it certification, but we're going to change the language mm -hmm. to mental health program approval process. And Got so it. that keeps that clean. clean. Mm -hmm. um, we're still in the process of doing a crosswalk. Uh, FFA is a new uh, facility type for specialty mental health services. And so we're, we're working with DSS on doing a crosswalk of what is their CCL licensing versus our Medi-Cal certification versus the program, mental health program approval process. And now to add an overlay to that is accreditation and their three main accrediting bodies. And are there duplicate efforts? Is the timing the same? Is the timing different? So that's the work that's happening now. We know that there is hunger for resolution on this, uh, which again, I beg your indulgence with trying to get us to this meeting this afternoon so we can have some closure <laughs> on, on getting this resolved. I think it's 3 o'clock, isn't it? Is the meeting's at 3 o'clock. So. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so the monitoring of STRTPs, you know, the, the Department of Healthcare Services contracts with the mental health plans. Uh, so our responsibility is for oversight and monitoring of the mental health plans, which we're going to talk a lot uh, about later on in the agenda. Um, so that will continue with then the mental health plans are responsible for monitoring those that they have contracts with. They do have selective provider contracting authority, and so uh, they will be responsible for monitoring that. But we are having conversations with DSS on, I think there's a desire to do some co-monitoring and oversight uh, together. We haven't quite figured all of that out yet, but there is conversations about how we can do that um, in unison, because I remember as a county director, I loved company, but I loved when they left. And so um, if we could do this one time and not interrupt the county twice, uh, I, I think counties would be very appreciative of that. Um, if an STRTP is found to be non-compliant, uh, we will ask them for a plan of correction. We have the authority to put them on probation. Uh, and if that doesn't result in improvement, we can do certification, suspension, and revocation. Um, the timeline is, is that we hope to have uh, regulations done before the end of this year, but in lieu of regulations, we do uh, have information notice authority uh, to provide some guidance and direction uh, for the counties and the STRTPs. Um, I think there's a DSS question on the timeline. Thank you. Greg Rose again for the Department of Social Services. I think w the way we look at the, the, the work together, we would just say that the, the timelines, I would describe it as a critical dependency. They need to go together. Work needs to happen together. And then again, we're closely in collaboration and conversation about outcomes. I think that is another term that we've had to spend some time in defining because what outcomes DSS looks for are not the same outcomes that the Department of Healthcare Services would look for. Um, we do have our uh, performance outcome system that you're going to hear more about in the agenda. And really what we're looking at uh, is efficacy of treatment um, and that these treatments 
efforts that and interventions that we're doing really do make a difference in the child's life, which I think is different from what DSS looks at regarding their outcomes, regarding having the child moved into a safe home and with the family and permanency and, and those kinds of things. So I'll open it up for questions. Yeah, I mean, from my lay perspective. Clearly, we're interested in the efficacy of treatment as well to make, right. uh, but it's true that this, uh, the, the term uh, outcomes is used differently and different, uh, but it, I think we're in, in alignment with um, right. what you just heard. Right. Um, on page five of the agenda above the specific questions, uh, you'll see there's a section that um, lists um, general kind of concerns. Um, so if you look at number two, role of county mental health and AB 403 implementation is still unclear. If you could kind of address that paragraph. Sure, I'll, I'll take a, a stab at it and both Greg and Karen can add in. So I think um, just as we um, gave a couple of examples about how we as departments are having to do a lot of cross um, departmental work and coordination and how words are different, um, the same applies in the county um, just as well between the county welfare um, side of the services as well as the county behavioral health. And so we recently issued um, a joint letter from the two departments to the counties um, kind of encouraging them to do the same thing that we've been doing, which is reach out to your uh, county um, counterparts and those conversations are starting to have to align. Obviously, the inclusion and the use of and the um, reliance on the county behavioral health system is absolutely critical to making this entire thing work. And so we, from a state perspective, are committed to um, both providing the right technical assistance and obviously to the extent that we have um, items that we have to do from a department perspective. I know social services shares that, but within the counties, they are also going to have to um, rely on each other for the blending of these um, services and things. But without the county behavioral health, um, both uh, system as well as their providers that they use, this cannot work. They are the, the nexus of, of how this entire proposal, I think, you know, really hangs together. So I, I would just add that, um, you know, through the KDA process, there has been a lot more conversations on the local level between the social services side and the mental health side. And I think um, the child and family team is one of those core practice models that really um, has a foundation for making sure that both sides are, are at the table because at the end of the day, both sides want what is in the best interest of that child. I'm reflecting back on the CCR implementation timeline from part A of today's agenda and, and, and Director Lightborn's comments about um, we won't experience a full culture shift by January 1, 2017. But given what you shared, Director, about the, the semantics issues being beyond semantics but real core differences of, of how you implement and how you define these terms, um, tell me how you feel given the areas that we've just outlined in the questions um, so far in terms of um, timing and being ready to at least start the process and have some of these core pieces in place by January 1 to even be able to launch. Tell me how you're feeling about the time frame. Um, I think that, you know, we have worked closely with the department um, on the t time frame. I think it is both aggressive and yet um, both doable. I think. As um, Director Lightborn said, it's an evolution, and so there's not going to be a, a date by which we say, you know, everything will be done by X. Mm -hmm. um, just as any program we have, it has um, both kind of the the key apex of a um, time frame start in terms of January 1 is the date that we're all driving to, but I think that when you look at the regulations and the certifications and the contracting and the rates, and then, you know, from the start to the finish when children actually start rolling into these homes and we start monitoring outcomes, you are looking at a multi-year, you know, evolution um, that in five years we will probably, you know, these departments will be in front of you within five years um, talking about, you know, where we have come and what we have in place today. But 
I don't know that we would say or ever be so bold as to say that on a certain date this will be done. But I think, you know, our key interest in getting things done by the end of the year are around um, the broad um, framework documents, guidelines, guidance, um, the things that the counties need in order to, again, with start the resources, the start the work. And so that's what we're committed to at least doing by the end of the year. Things like certifications and identified outcomes, some of those key critical areas right. you all have talked about. Senator so, Monning, any question on your part? Um, just real quickly, I uh, appreciate the collaboration that's reflected here. Um, Director Kent, you mentioned kind of encouragement at the county level for similar collaboration between county welfare and behavioral health. Beyond encouraging that, my guess is there's going to be different commitments or capacities among the different counties. Is there any follow-up or do they need to confirm how they're doing that in moving this forward? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll take a stab at that. It we are really also engaged with our county partners and the affiliates, meaning that CWDA and CBHDA are important partners in this process. Um, we have heard that they are planning to do a summit together, hopefully this spring or summer, which I don't remember ever having that venue to to do exactly what you're talking about, to make sure that everyone is on the same page regarding this implementation. And so we will provide technical assistance wherever we can, uh, but we're also encouraging counties to talk to each other on the local level. Great, well that's helpful. It sounds like there's some planned actual convergence to make sure it's happening and move it forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, LAO? Ben Johnson from the LAO. Um, many of the questions and comments of the committee and the panelists address a lot of the concerns that we raise in our analysis. Um, but I do wish to raise that the, the governor's budget requests resources for the certification of STRTPs, whereas foster family homes are under similar requirements to provide uh, necessary mental health services to the children that are placed there. And so we have an outstanding question with the department about how certification of FFAs will, will occur to, to ensure access to those services. Thank you. Thank you. Finance? Any public comment on issue one? Seeing none, let's move on to issue two, psychotropic medications, SB 238. Great. Um, so again, I wanted to um, both uh, acknowledge the legislature's work with the administration last year on several pieces of legislation um, that um, pertain to both us, social services, as well as the medical board. Um, I wanted to highlight, in case you weren't aware, that we recently released um, some HEDA scores um, that certainly Dr. Scott can talk about um, that show um, some of the measurements that we've been able to take in terms of foster kids and the antipsychotics versus um, the regular Medi-Cal population in terms of the child population. Um, one note, and this was a learning experience for me when I um, first started working in this topic last year, is that psych um, psychotropics is a broader category, and really what we have um, from a clinical perspective, both in Dr. Scott's work as well as in our pharmacy, have really focused on the smaller, more um, clinically consequential drugs known as the antipsychotics, and so a lot of what we have been wanting to stress is that that is really what um, we think is the most critical. Obviously, psychotropics um, imply a larger degree of um, both health and behavioral health indicators going on with a foster child, but the antipsychotics, the potential for over-prescribing or double-prescribing or, you know, overlapping prescriptions is certainly a, a far more serious um, clinical effect. And so I just wanted to make sure that, you know, you were aware that we are tracking those HEDIS measures, and then there's obviously other projects in place as it pertains to um, working um, both from a resource standpoint as well as working with social services and the counties on the sharing of the data. So... Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Scott on some of the more 
detailed nuances. Okay, great. Thank you, and a pleasure to be here. I'm Dr. Lynette Scott, the Chief Medical Information Officer at Healthcare Services, and have really had a pleasure working with our, our partners at Social Services and throughout the department, and the, the work uh, really represents a huge effort, uh, a huge team effort, and so a, a acknowledgement to that. Um, so in this proposal, we have uh, proposals both for healthcare services and and Department of Social Services related to staffing to help support the implementation of both SB 238 and SB 40, 484. Um, so speaking uh, specifically to the Department of Healthcare Services portion, that includes uh, one position that's a research position, and uh, a key part of that will be to help work with our partners at Social Services and the counties, both in terms of, of developing reports that would be public reports, as well as using the data for client services at the, at the local level. Um, so it includes both of those, and as um, Director Kent was talking about, uh, another key piece that we're contributing through that is that understanding and knowledge about that uh, claims data, the, the clinical data that we have, the administrative data that we have, how to interpret it, how to understand it, how does it relate to itself, what happens as it changes in terms of both how we collect it, um, as well as just changes in coding and things that happen over time. So um, we very much uh, are committed to this um, and, and the request for resources to make sure that we have a dedicated staff that can help support that data work throughout. So in terms of kind of providing an overview, I think we talked about, I'll, I'll step through some of the questions and Greg will also provide a, a highlight then of the, the DSS component of the proposal, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Please. So um, in terms of, uh, again, kind of guiding, using your questions to guide these comments, uh, one of the things that we've talked about in the proposal is the, the data use agreements and the, the global interagency agreement. Uh, we affectionately call it uh, the global, uh, which uh, in this case, uh, again, kind of going back to the nomenclature comment, uh, this was a uh, president setting, and uh, because of that, it, it is unique, uniquely known as the global, but as other examples follow that, we will want to be more specific that this is the uh, data sharing agreement for children in foster care with social services, healthcare services, and counties. Um, and so it very specifically, uh, one of the things that's uh, precedent setting about it is that in developing that, it is focused around the population that we each have responsibility uh, and legislative authority to serve and to provide services for, um, as opposed to the way we typically do data use agreements, which um, will typically call out specific data elements for specific purposes. And and uh, in, in crafting this, part of our goal was to be responsive to all of our statutory requirements around data use and documentation, but also to create the uh, environment that we can learn and adjust as we go. So that instead of being fixed to a specific set of, of data elements and having to then revise the contract, so to speak, every time we learn something and shift, um, we're focused on the population. So this is very much focused on taking care of children in foster care and being able to have that environment between the two departments and our county partners to be able to share client level data to facilitate services, to look at how uh, different services interact and to make sure that they're supportive and not contraindicated. Um, so we are, are doing that under the global. We have, uh, I believe it's up to 18 counties now that have signed on to that agreement. Um, we do also have some separate uh, specific data use agreements with um, some, some specific counties, and those are most focused. Um, they are specific to particular data elements, particularly around pharmacy claims. And this is where we're also working very closely with Karen and, and her folks uh, in terms of our mental health contracts and our substance use treatment contracts, in terms of how we can facilitate, use those to facilitate data sharing uh, as appropriate as well, so uh, very much looking at that. So that's kind of a highlight of, of sort of that, that terminology around uh, data use agreements, sort of the traditional, the, the global interagency is really a data use agreement, but it's, it's special because it's those three department uh, entities, essentially organizations, uh, coming together to take care of these children. And so what we're doing in terms of, of documenting is having that, that paper trail that says this is exactly what we're sharing for what purpose, but doing it in a way that doesn't involve a contract change, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, which has been very helpful. So we, we've already been learning and adjusting. 
uh, as, as I talked about, uh, again, some of these reports will feed into, and some of this, this combined work will feed into public reporting um, in terms of uh, we've been working on creating a matched or linked data set, so it includes data from child welfare services and our claims data um, to bring that together into one place. And we're, we're putting it literally into one physical location that both teams will use to do analysis as we move forward. Um, it's taken some time to get that set up, but uh, kind of in terms of of, of what it often takes to do these things, I think we've actually been moving very quickly. Um, so we're really excited about um, getting that in place to move forward, and that will also then support providing that data to the counties um, in terms of being able to look at clients. And initially, the focus has been looking at uh, psychotropic medications and pharmacy claims. Um, one of the things I, I think of note, again, to the nomenclature issue that uh, Director Kent was talking about, uh, antipsychotics are, are pretty specific, but psychotropics, and especially when we look at the way Welfare Institution Code talks about in the context of children in foster care. There are many medications that we would not identify as psychotropic medications as a drug class, but could be used for purposes that have a psychotropic effect. Um, and so as we've been going through this process of revisiting our analysis, how we present data, that's an issue that's come up where folks have said, well, so what drugs did you include when you use that? And mm -hmm. Why didn't you include? And some of that gets into the challenge we have that we do have administrative data. It tells you what we paid for. We don't have the detail that they do at the local level to say this is what it was prescribed for. Mm -hmm. um, and so that alters some of what we can do from our statewide reporting versus what we can understand at a local level. So as we move forward, we will be able to um, share that data, uh, particularly to facilitate that work by the public health nurse um, that was talked about earlier, not just for psychotropic medications, but for broader care, including things like immunizations, oral health, and other things that we can learn from our claims and they can use to help coordinate that care in a holistic way for these children um, to make sure that we're providing uh, appropriate services. And it includes the mental health services as well as uh, perhaps primary care and other, other places that that care is delivered, uh, fee-for-service managed care both. So we're looking at that holistically. You sure can, then I'll follow up. Yes, are you doing the psychotropic versus antipsychotic? No, I was- Okay, go ahead. I was looking <laughs> at the, I am interested in that, in the nuances mm -hmm. there in terms mm -hmm. of impacts and effects, but on the data sharing, mm -hmm. so I can see the utility of having that capacity. How do you protect uh, you know, HIPAA concerns, mm -hmm. confidentiality, where you may have some people entering this who, have met, who are medically authorized to work with that child, but you might have on the social services side somebody who's not a medical provider, and maybe I just show my ignorance of how the system works. Are those social service providers entitled to access to that medical data? So this is where um, we're working, we're, this is part of what makes it complex, right? So um, at the state level, so Department of Social Services, Healthcare Services, again, we're, we're looking at how we bring that data together so that um, the, the, the folks that social services will see are just those children that are in their care um, so that it's consistent with the kind of information that might have been entered into child welfare services manually, but now we're able to compare it against, again, what we actually paid for to look at how those things reconcile and, and we can look at it holistically. Um, at the county level, this is where we are uh, working with the counties to make sure they understand uh, both the restrictions for the, the data that comes from us that has the HIPAA restrictions as well as the social <laughs> services data that has its specific restrictions to make sure that they, they understand who's using it for what and that it's being used appropriately. So the county would only receive data about children that are in their care, um, that are assigned to their county. Um, so we would not, it's not that we're creating a shared environment that everybody sees everybody. It's, it's we're very much using the kind of those technical pieces to help say, to know that this is who you're responsible for, so this is who you receive information about that you would otherwise be able to see because you have the potential to access their their medical chart so to help support them. Clearly, their that's front and center. In Absolutely, how you're doing this. I can see on the other side from kind of confidentiality and patient mm -hmm. privacy, the value of getting aggregated data that's um, not patient specific, but right. gives us some of the data we might be interested in in the difference between antipsychotic versus mm -hmm. other classifications. 
Yeah, so that's very much why we're trying, we're trying to, again, semantics sometimes come out to be the, the, the key thing. Client data for, for supervision and treatment purposes um, to make sure the right care is being delivered, very different than public reporting and what we release from a public perspective, very much making sure that's de-identified. We don't want any of that to be able to be used to figure out who an individual is. So, so we have a set of guidelines we use for that. And, Thank you, Madam. And I think to the question about the delay, you know, why are some, why are there not other, or why aren't there more agreements? I think the issues that Lynette highlighted, um, each county has their own county council. So we've had attorneys and our privacy office, um, you know, we obviously are invoking a lot of HIPAA requirements and, um, you know, penalties and other things that come along with a HIPAA ag agreement. And so that's what we've had to work through. The counties have each had to work through that on their legal side. So they have had concerns about what we require in terms of, HIPAA, and so that is in part what you are raising and why some of these have taken longer. I was just gonna uh, remind you, Senator Monning, that the enabling legislation um, w was a Mitchell bill, so you know it was done right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure why they're confused. That, I was that, trying that. to send you signals, okay. but, <laughs> and I believe you voted for it, so it makes it double right. <laughs> uh, my question has to do with the antipsychotics versus the psychotropics, because I think that, that we as a legislature need to be clear, um, and so we're speaking the same language, and, and that you fully understand legislative intent when we develop the policy. And so we, I might want to have my staff have a sidebar, um, um, because I think, it, and to bring in Senator Bell and others, and Senator Monning, who had carried bills around the over prescription from our perspective and experience of, of psychotropics in the foster care system. So based on this new information from my perspective, I'd like for us to have a conversation because I, we shouldn't continue to use the broader category if that's not truly um, um, the, the category that's um, causing the most harm, using that term loosely compared to your experience. But, but the goal was to have the departments be clear about who was prescribing what to whom within your care. So thank you very much for that. And I, I concur. I think there's, 